everyone. Um, good, I guess it's the evening right now. 5.45, it counts in my mind. Uh, I'm gonna give it another minute or so. I know some other sessions are letting out. Uh, and then we'll just get started. Thanks for joining us. if you'd like to join up here. We got you. We'll take what we can get. All right. Taking a few days off work and I hope they're coming tomorrow too. Um, so we're gonna have like a week off. That'll be nice. Um stay at home. I've never flown with him. Yeah, he just stays at home. Did you guys go there? Let's get going. I feel like you're having so many tech notes problems. <laughs> you ready, Elizabeth? All right. Okay, let's, oh, this is off again. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. My name is Allie Funk. I'm Freedom House's Research Director for Technology and Democracy. Uh, we're really excited to, to host this conversation amongst three really brilliant folks that have taught me a lot about this field. Um, what we're going to do today is I will give a very quick, quick overview of Freedom on the Net uh, and explain what that report even is. Uh, then we'll dive into an interesting conversation with these folks up here about internet freedom, how it's changed over the past decade, where we're going. Uh, and then I'll open it up to y'all. We're a small group, uh, so I hope we can get nitty gritty in the, the issue area. Um, so first, let me just have you all introduce yourself. Uh, Olga, why don't we start with you? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Olga Kirilyuk. I work as a technical advisor on uh, internet governance and uh, digital rights at uh, Internews. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Palami Praditit. I'm the founder and executive director of the Manushaya Foundation. We are a feminist human rights organization based in Thailand, working mainly in Laos and Thailand. And we work at the intersection of digital rights, corporate accountability, and access to justice for local communities. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Guus van Zwol. I work with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs on digital human rights. Thanks, gang. So what is Freedom on the Net? Um, it is Freedom House's annual assessment of internet freedom in 70 countries around the world. Um, we look at how easily uh, can folks access, to the, access the internet, what does the internet look like in their countries, and are their rights protected or violated um, by the state, by non-state actors, by companies. Um, just last week, we launched the 2023 edition of the report, the 13th version of it, um, and just going to give you some of the top findings. Uh, if you want to read the full report, which I would urge you to do, we have some fun graphics. We have country reports written by these great folks up here um, at freedomhouse.org, but some just quick key findings that I think will ground our conversation today about where we are in the internet freedom space. Um, 2023. 13th consecutive year uh, of decline for internet freedom. Hopefully next year I'll have the first 
first year of improvement in internet freedom. Doesn't seem like it, but you know, girl can hope. Uh, attacks on free expression grew more common around the world. Like I said, we've been doing this for 13 years and each year we have another record high uh, of governments assaulting the fundamental right to free expression. So in at least 55 of our 70 countries we covered, people were arrested for simply expressing themselves. Um, we had a record high of 41 governments in which uh, their regulators blocked websites hosting political, social, and religious speech. Um, and this year, what we really uh, zoomed in on is how advances in artificial intelligence are deepening the crisis for internet freedom. So, um, you know, we looked at three different ways that's happening. That's it's AI is driving. Uh, intrusive surveillance, uh, empowering censorship, and also contributing to disinformation campaigns. Um, so the two specific deep dives we did is first about how the affordability and accessibility of generative AI technology is lowering the barrier of entry for disinformation for the disinformation market. So we found that generative AI tech was used in 16 different countries to distort information on political or social issues, often during times of crisis like elections, protests, um, and other you know, conflict areas. And then second, we looked at how automated systems are enabling governments to conduct more precise and subtle censorship. Um, so we found in at least 22 countries, governments are requiring companies to deploy automated systems to censor speech protected under international, international human rights standards. Um, so we kind of, the, some of the call to action that will drive our conversation today uh, is because of the ways that AI is augmenting digital repression, we call for the urgent need to regulate it. Um, and we think the lessons learned over the past decade or 15 years of internet governance debates really provide a roadmap on how to regulate AI. So first, we need to not overly rely on companies. I think we, you know, at the beginning of the Internet Freedom Project, uh, had a big hope of, you know, the internet's gonna be this liberating technology, gonna protect democracy, we don't need to regulate it. Boy, were we proven wrong, so we should be careful uh, and not leave it all up to the private sector. Second, we've learned a lot about what good governance actually looks like from the government. Um, so centering human rights standard, increasing transparency over the design, use, and impact of these systems. And then finally, uh, the lesson learned that um, I don't think has been learned enough of civil society around the world really needed to be involved in this process. And right now, in the race to regulate AI, civil society is really being left out, particularly those from the global majority. So we close our report. Um, you know, we think that if AI is designed and deployed safely and fairly, it can actually be used to bolster internet freedom. Um, and there's a lot of different efforts around the world, uh, AI helping people evade government censorship, being used to detect disinformation and document human rights abuses. Um, but we also note that, you know, as we pay attention more to AI, we have to be really careful not to lose momentum on internet freedom issues more broadly. So um, reversing internet freedom decline really requires regulating AI, but not forgetting about longstanding threats to free expression, access to information and privacy. So top line key findings, I will stop talking for a minute. You, again, you can go to freedomhouse.org and read the rest. Um, Olga, I wanna start with a question for you. You've been working on these issues for quite a long time and uh, wearing a couple different hats. What have you learned about internet freedom over the past decade? What has shifted in this space and where do you think we are today and where you think we might be going? Lots of questions. Yeah, it couldn't be an easier question. Uh, but I think uh, literally um, probably everything has changed during this uh, last 10 years. And uh, when I was thinking uh, um, and looking back, uh, 10 years ago is exactly when I was uh, uh, starting to write my uh, PhD thesis and when I came to uh, my law department and uh, the topic uh, which uh, I was suggesting was uh, cybersecurity and that was something everyone was looking at me like this is something not important. We don't know what it is. Uh, just choose something which is common sense for everyone. And uh, then uh, I had to drop that and uh, to look more into like what is this multi-stakeholderism, how this has been developing and uh, whether at all there is any intersection with the international law. And uh, I think also what has changed is uh, that we had a lot of fascination back 10 years ago 
uh, which changed to quite a lot of frustration by now. Uh, we were hoping that uh, uh, this multi-stakeholder model and uh, having everyone around the same table would solve uh, a lot of issues uh, for us and uh, that uh, uh, we it would be pretty easy for us to reach a consensus and to find a way how to regulate technology. And uh, we were hoping that at some point uh, probably the legal regulation would be also catching up with uh, the pace how technology is being uh, developed. But uh, still it's uh, 10 years have passed and we don't really see that uh, this uh, catch up has happened. Uh, but also uh, there have been many things uh, evolving uh, in a good perspective. I think uh, what we have definitely observed is uh, that uh, the uh, public awareness of uh, internet freedom has uh, raised and uh, this is uh, also, uh, this is a fair argument to make uh, for every stakeholder, for governments, for private sector, uh, for end users, uh, for civil society. I think everyone now understands the importance of uh, internet freedom and digital rights because probably 10 years ago this concept did not make much sense for many people. Uh, I believe still sometimes now it's, it is still difficult uh, to explain what is essentially internet freedom as a concept, uh, uh, what it uh, covers and uh, how we should uh, stand for this. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, this awareness is growing and this is important because uh, somehow we reach the point when we understand that this, uh, that this is uh, the values which we should be protecting. At the same time, uh, same as uh, positively the technology is developing, there is a lot of uh, innovation, uh, uh, AI is developing, blockchain is developing, they are bringing new opportunities, but they are also bringing a lot of uh, uh, risks and uh, challenges, uh, for example, uh, to security and uh, safety, and uh, there is always uh, this uh, uh, very slippery borderline, where do you find uh, uh, this... Uh, mm, uh, how do you how do you divide uh, essentially uh, the freedom and the security? Because uh, in many cases uh, the governments uh, they uh, uh, tend to go too much into the security and uh, they uh, tend to limit uh, uh, internet freedom. Uh, so uh, that's why on the negative side we also see that uh, there is a lot of uh, development of uh, uh, digital authoritarianism and it's not only uh, by authoritarian countries but we can also uh, see it in some shape and form uh, being uh, implemented uh, also uh, by democracies across the world but uh, let's say 10 years ago probably we still didn't see that uh, large-scale shutdowns and that much happening uh, across the world. We didn't see that much of uh, content moderation and uh, censorship uh, as it is now. We probably could not imagine that uh, we will have so many problems uh, uh, with uh, regulating uh, uh, private companies and uh, tech giants and uh, uh, that it would be so difficult uh, to find uh, uh, common ground and to agree on, uh, on the regulation because, as I said, it was uh, so much hope that this uh, sitting around the same table just will solve the issue. Uh, we also have... Uh, uh we have also seen that uh, these uh, systems uh, for mass biometric surveillance and facial recognition have uh, developed a lot. And uh, again, uh, there are countries uh, which are um, which are providing uh, these uh, these tools and uh, this technology, uh, and there are countries uh, which are uh, simply uh, using it without uh, sometimes even properly understanding uh, what are the consequences and uh, how this technology can uh, uh, violate uh, uh, human rights or without putting proper uh, legal safeguards, and uh, then this leads uh, to situations uh, when you just don't have uh, uh, the guarantees in law that you can uh, properly protect your rights. Um, also, from the positive side, I think it's still good that we uh, that we still continue collaborating. We still continue uh, talking to each other. We uh, somehow see that probably um, maybe some models are not working that well. Maybe they need adjustment. Uh, uh, I would say we are quite slow to to accept these adjustments to uh, to this multi-stakeholder uh, convenience because. Uh, because again, we see that uh, many people are not happy, many people want actions, uh, not simply the discussions, uh, some concrete partnerships, some, uh, some concrete initiatives coming up uh, uh, from these conversations, which is not happening. And uh, I don't think this is a fair point to say, okay, this was created as a forum for discussion, because if uh, everything around us is evolving, technology is evolving, uh, legal landscape is evolving, so we can't just say that we want to keep discussing this uh, this thing if we, if uh, we really can make uh, a difference and uh, can make a change um so many things have changed <laughs> and uh, we probably could go uh, um, into a long conversation about this uh, but essentially uh, i think the world is becoming even more complicated than it used to be 10 years ago probably it's not what we expected but that's where we are
we're going to pull on the multi-stakeholder thread uh, in a little bit and what um, meaningful stakeholder engagement looks like. I actually didn't know that was your dissertation focus. That's really interesting. Um, but first, I want to touch on the regulatory points you made. Um, I think you're exactly right. It's It's been, I think that is actually something in the field I'm probably most intrigued by because I think the trade-offs around regulation are really complex. Um, and who's, I want to pull you in here because uh, you are European, if folks didn't know, based on the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs title. Uh, and the EU specifically has served as a global leader um, on regulating the internet, sort of providing uh, what we think about as kind of this third way for internet regulation in between the Chinese model and the US laissez-faire traditional approach. Um, and we saw with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, how it served as a global model for data protection laws after it was a, enacted in 2018, and we now have the Digital Services Act. Uh, for folks who don't know, a really ambitious piece of legislation um, governing online content uh, and a whole host of other things. And we're also in the uh, negotiation pro process of the EU AI Act. So I'm curious, you know, this has been sort of talked about as the Brussels effect of how what's happening in the EU, EU is impacting the regulatory state globally. How do you think about the Brussels effect and making sure particularly that the good parts of the regulation get implemented elsewhere uh, with the, the sort of challenge that, you know, the same law in a country with really strong rule of law standards being implemented in a country with poor rule of law standards has vastly different human rights impact. So how do you think about that? And what are you all working on? Well, thank you, Ali. Well, we want to keep the good things, right? That's basically my answer. <laughs> no, but I mean, no, we, we, I mean, <laughs> it's difficult. I mean, it's a difficult, it's like a tightrope, a tightrope that we have to walk. I mean, also l listening here the last day here at the IGF, it's, it's either two things. We have to fight censorship and we have to fight disinformation. And it's difficult to do both at the same time, right? You have to find a balance between the two. And, um, and, I mean, as the Netherlands, we are very proud to have these EU laws. We would not be able to regulate big tech on ourselves. I mean, we're happy to, to, to do it together with, with other European countries. And um, we're also proud that it's that, that it comes out of a long multi-stakeholder engagement process where we have, um, there have been uh, rounds of input from civil society, from companies, there have been hearings, there have been draft text, yada, yada, yada. And, and, and that has, I think, come up with a pretty solid text that we are really happy about and we're really looking forward to full implementation early next year. I mean, it has started, but we, we're building up towards it. And um, so, I mean, there are two ways in, uh, in how you can see the Brussels effect, right? So the first of all, the, when the GDPR was, was implemented in the European Union, some companies said, well, we're going to implement it for everyone. I mean, it would be just easier to just ro roll it out over all countries. And the other way is that uh, countries copied the, 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 the text basically to align themselves into our system and then it would be easier for them to 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 well to protect privacy in, uh, in, in their in their systems um, and this is something that we're really focusing on as also as, as the Netherlands last uh, month we have uh, released the English translation of the Dutch international cyber strategy. You can find it on our website, government.nl. And uh, in it, we really, s we really state that we are going to propagate the principles of the DSA and uh, the AI Act and the DMA to, to strengthen this, the, uh, this, this Brussels effect, because we do think that, that these um, regulatory frameworks provide the right balance between providing um, strong, uh, a strong regulatory framework, while at the same time providing room for transparency and protecting human rights. And uh, that is, I think, that's, that's the basis. I mean, uh, we, we, we've, we've argued long and, 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 and hard to, to and, and, and negotiated to get it also into the, into the DSA. And it, it is there, references to the um, uh, global, the principles on, on business and human rights are there. Uh, there, 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 there are strong transparency clauses. There's a way on when your, 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 when your, your, your comments on Facebook or any other uh, platform are being removed or, or downgraded, you're able to, 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 to go into appeal. I mean, there's a, there, there, there will be a whole process for that, and I think those, and and that's all in the text. So when that text will be copied, hopefully, um, 
those parts will also already are, are already ingrained into the system that 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 and 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 that way we try to promote that way of of thinking on on these issues to to other countries but also i mean when we are going to have bilateral discussions either as the Netherlands with other countries or as the EU with other countries, we also will urge third countries to not only fully uh, or partly adapt to these EU regulations, but also really implement these human rights and democratic clauses that we find so important on this. And this is something that, that our government is very committed to and, and will be focusing on for the next few years. And I would also like to thank you and uh, congratulate you with a great report. Thank you. Um, that was really helpful. Uh, Emily, I'm going to come to you because I think, uh, is it still on? oh yeah, it's still on. Okay, cool. Um, you, your organization, Minutia, you all help run the hashtag stop digital dictatorship, dictator, dictatorship, uh, coalition, which is, uh, working to, I mean, stop digital dictatorship across Southeast Asia. It's in the name. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the goals of the coalition is to make rights respecting regulatory frameworks and I think particularly from the region is very exemplary of how uh, really problematic laws um, can undermine human rights. So what are you thinking about uh, of what type of regulatory provisions are the most helpful or harmful? How does it relate to AI? If I'm gonna put the buzzword in, the zeitgeist. Uh, tell me what's on your mind on this. Thank you, Alina. Thank you for organizing this, uh, this important session. Um, so I'm coming from a region where, according to Freedom of the World, we are among 10 ASEAN countries. Six of, us, six, six of our countries are under authoritarian regimes, and four of them are semi-authoritarian regimes. And most of the time when I tell people I'm coming from Southeast Asia, especially Thailand, people are like, wow! Because everybody has this impression that Thailand is such an amazing holiday destination. So I really want to emphasize that, and I urge people to please read the Freedom of the Net report, because if you read the report, you will realize that among the countries from Southeast Asia that are being assessed uh, in the report, many of us are not free. Thailand is not free. Cambodia is not free. Vietnam is not free. Myanmar is not free. Indonesia and the Philippines are, semi are partially free. Why? It's because our governments, authoritarian governments, are weaponizing laws. And so there's, there's a proliferation of cyber laws that are targeting dissenting voices and human rights defenders under the name of national security. So in terms of harmful regulation that we have seen uh, growing in Southeast Asia, are all the regulations that are meant to protect national security. And anyone who is attacking the government or criticizing you know, the government is a threat to national security. And so we have a lot of cases of pro-democracy activists in Thailand, in Laos, throughout Southeast Asia that are being jailed for just voicing uh, and for just telling the truth on Facebook, through Facebook posts. We have uh, a human rights lawyer, Arnon, who was just sent in jail a few weeks ago and who is facing 14 charges under the Computer Crime Act and the Les Majesty Law and who will face up to 210 years in jail just because he's calling for monarchy reforms and they are calling for true democracy. So I think there's a real need for us to look at what are those harmful regulations in Southeast Asia, but also how governments in Southeast Asia are also regulating tech companies. So just for example, in December 2022 in Thailand, the Thai government passed a decree forcing and obliging te tech companies to remove content within 24 hours, any content that is against national security. But again, there's no clear definition of what is national security. So everything can become a threat to national security. So for us, what we really want when it comes to good regulation or regulation that we want to see are regulations that obviously are protecting our online freedom, that are in line with international human rights law, that are protecting our privacy, whereas surveillance is not, is not used against us, because you know in Thailand and Indonesia, we're also facing the Pegasus software that is being misused against activists, against journalists, against politicians. So it's really important for us that we have regulations that are human-centered. And to your question regarding AI, so generative AI can be powerful, right? It can improve our lives, but as we heard this morning, it also has a lot of risks. And in Southeast Asia, we have faced the misuse of AI, especially when it comes to facial recognition, when it comes to surveillance, and also when it comes to bias, especially in terms of language. So if you are in, from a Southeast Asian country, our structure, our language structure in some of our countries is Sanskrit or Pali. So if you are 
using Facebook. And Facebook is using AI in terms of content moder moderation to remove content or to block content that is violating the community standards. How can an AI machine can distinguish a word that has in one sound or in one word five different meanings? Right? So that's why for us it's really important that when we are talking about regulation, we are talking about the need to also regulate tech companies. It's really important for us that we move the discussion from voluntary guidelines. And this morning we heard about the Hiroshima AI process. So if you're an activist on the ground, like I'm a human rights lawyer and I'm working with a lot of activists on the ground, if I'm going back to them saying, you know, I went to IGF and I heard about the Hiroshima um, AI process, they're gonna tell me, oh, new guidelines, new voluntary measures, where is it going to take us? I think we move to a point where we need real regulations and we need mandatory due diligence. It's not enough nowadays for Meta, for Microsoft, and for other tech companies to tell us that they are conducting human rights impact assessment that are voluntary, and what they are barely doing is just identifying the most salient human rights issues. Then they are engaging us in the stakeholders' engagement, and they are presenting to us the most salient human rights issues, as if we already didn't know them. You know, we already know the human rights uh, issues, right? So we go through these stakeholders' engagement processes where just in that identification of the human rights issues are or presented, but there is no prevention, there's no mitigation, and there's no addressing those salient human rights issues. But if companies are serious about implementing the UNGPs, but also the OECD guidelines for multinationals, they should be able to identify, but also address, prevent and address the impact, but also provide remedy. So a uh, tech company telling us that the appeal mechanism or reaching out to the human rights team is the best remedy offered as of today, it's not enough. You know, there's a real need to legislate the UNGPs into real law. There's a real need for mandatory human rights due diligence and a due diligence that is, that is actually meaningful. So meaningful stakeholders engagement, not just a tick the box exercise. Because I think, I think a lot of us in Southeast Asia are tired of being called into stakeholders engagement call and we give our input and that's just nothing in terms of follow up. So meaningful stakeholders engage, but not only with civil society, but also with groups that are directly impacted by the misuse of the platform by governments, by trolls, you know, in Southeast Asia. We are also facing a proliferation of cyber armies from Myanmar, from Laos, from Thailand. Governments are investing in cyber armies, and we are so small compared to them. When we are one or two people, you know, working in a human rights organization on digital rights, it's not enough to fight against a cyber army. So how do we do? And when we turn into tech companies for support, there's nothing they can really do because they are not be being regulated. So it's time for tech companies to be effectively regulated through meaningful um, mandatory human rights due diligence. And we need those mandatory human rights due diligence to come from countries where those tech companies are operating because then there would be uh, an, an extra territorial obligations for those companies to make sure that throughout the supply chain, also the country offices, um, the UN guiding principles and due diligence will be respected. Um, but we also want um, responsibility and remedy. So we want civil and criminal liability for those companies as well. For example, what happened in Myanmar and the way that the platform, Facebook platform has been misused by the government and by other groups to, to promote hate speech against Rohingya. The fact that nobody is being held into account is not normal. The fact that nobody is being held into account in terms of responsibility and criminal and civil liability is just not normal. So we really need an effective mandatory human rights due diligence that would also include impact human rights assessment for AI, and that would include meaningful stakeholders engagement and criminal and uh, civil liability of the company. I think this next year with uh, DSA implementation is gonna be really interesting to see how those requirements of um, impact assessments is gonna play out. Um, and if you all hadn't seen, there is uh, the recent, um, I don't know what day it came out, but there's a now a new database, thanks to the DSA, where a lot of companies are reporting different content removal or different actions under their terms of service that you can actually go through, um, which I think will take a very long time because there's a lot, of, a lot in there. Let's go to this question on multi-stakeholder engagement a little bit that you brought up because um, I think this is something that we think a lot about, we hear a lot about, of, you know, what is actually like, what does multi-stakeholder engagement mean? How do you make that meaningful? Um, Who's? I'm going to come back to you. The, you mentioned your international cyber strategy. Um, in the document, it talks about incorporating more emerging countries and in internet governance and lays out the importance of multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. 
Um, how does the Netherlands plan to promote these objectives, particularly as it relates to inclusivity with civil society um, and also in the global majority who are on the front lines of digital repression? <coughs> well, that's an excellent question and a difficult one. And we try to, um, no, we, we do try to, to, to answer it also in our, in our strategy, but so, um we we um so basically we we try to do the following thing we try to 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 connect in our cyber strategy three strands of work we try to 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 connect the work that we do on like traditional cyber diplomacy cyber security with digital development work with our human rights work um and and like and, and as an over overarching team is internet governance there, and this is something that we that we that we that we try to 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 um, that's that, yeah that's something that we that we try to do in those in those, in those three ways and we and we do see it as a as a kind of we didn't mention it like that but I also always try to to see that either as a tree legged stool like a like a milking stool or something that you can have three legs in order to keep it balanced. You need to have some form of digitalization in order to, 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 to be digitally connected. You have to have also as a country, of course, to digital security in order to, to, ha to, to, to keep that structure safe. But at the same time, you need principles and good governance to also uh, to, to govern that, that, that structure. Otherwise, you're just implementing a censorship and, and, and surveillance uh, apparatus, right? So. So what 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 we do as 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 um, as 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 the, as the government is really try to to implement it in all our work. So we try to 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 through our development cooperation work, and we work with that with well also with our with our colleagues from the Freedom Online Coalition. We try to work on on, on principle, uh, principles for for digital for digitalization for donors in digitalization, in order to to imp to improve. Um, well, the digital rollout, rollout and connect the last third of the of the world that that's still unconnected. But at the same time, we do try to get these other principles in place as well. We do try also through the EU Global Gateway, for example, we try to make sure that we are then not only lo looking only at just getting everyone connected, but also make sure that, that that digital security and then also principles and good governance are part of that equation, and make sure that we we. Um, that we that and that and that th through those processes there there's a multi-stakeholder approach that we'll get voices from civil society uh, to to be part of that discussions locally, um, but this is still something that really in its, in its building block and we we are, this is something that we that we need to <laughs> need to work on, um, but but uh, but it's a clear aim that we are that we are that we set out in our strategy and we are, will. We'll have to roll that out for the next few years, but it's not, of course, the only thing we do. We also work with 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 local civil society, uh, with through our human rights program. We have a strong program called Voices uh, Safety Safety for Voices program, where we try to support human rights defenders and civil society organizations uh, on security, both physically, but most uh, as, an as a as a strong compo digital component. So all the programs that we run out that are that are on supporting civil society and human rights defenders have also always this digital component to it. So we do also try to mainstream it in those in those uh, in those in those settings. And then we do that, I mean that's work done from from The Hague, but then also the the, the same principles uh, apply to the work that we do through our embassies. Um, yeah th I think that's 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 where we're at. Um, I'm going to ask one more for Olga and one more for Emily and then we're going to open it up. Um, time has snuck up on me. So uh, Olga for you you teased that dissertation. Uh, so I'm gonna press on that a little bit. Um, and I should also add that um, the Netherlands is also taking chair of the Freedom Online Coalition next year. Um, the US government is chair now, and for folks who don't know, Freedom Online Coalition, multilateral body of 27 governments now? Thir how many? 38, where did I get 27? Wow, I am behind. I'm a bad advisory network member. Um, uh, try working to protect internet freedom around the world. So. I'm curious, it's a two-pronged question. Actually, I'm gonna ask the same to both of you all to hear your input. How can um, governments themselves, what does meaningful multi-stakeholderism look like to you? How can they make sure that they're listening to the different sectors? But also, what do you think the role of a, you know, the FOC, a multilateral body of you know, democratic governments that are really uh, committed to protecting internet freedom, what, 
how can they reverse this decline? Do you have any best practices they can adopt? Um, so you can take any of that. That's like seven questions in one. So I'll let you take it. This is actually what I also want uh, to know. Uh, maybe also, since we have this opportunity, maybe also Goose can help to uh, clarify that how essentially a civil society can get uh, better engaged in uh, FOC, especially because uh, this is also part of my uh, uh, job portfolio. I need to identify this connection point because uh, my team is running uh, the largest internet freedom project. We are covering five regions, uh, five regions across the world, and we are working with 120 implementing partners from civil society. So essentially, we have this uh, we have this pool of talent of uh, civil society activists and uh, human rights defenders, and uh, we would like to see uh, what is this entry point, how we can better coordinate, how we can help uh, engage them in your space, and uh, where do you see the value from uh, from these people, how they can meaningfully contribute to, to what you are doing, because. Uh, you had this uh, Freedom Online conference, uh, which uh, has not been held for the last uh, few years, uh, which I think was one of the opportunities uh, to get together for different uh, stakeholders uh, to discuss uh, uh, different issues which, which are important and, uh, uh, and making uh, uh, trends. Uh, but uh, this is not happening anymore. I know there is advisory network, but again, this is an uh, election-based process, which is also happening in, after in some periods. Uh, so I would say if uh, there is any opportunity to organize uh, some kind of um, periodic uh, consultations with the civil society, some uh, to choose some thematic issues so that it's not just about everything and about nothing at the same time, but uh, to make it uh, very specific uh, whether you want to focus on some regulatory issue, uh, whether it is something related uh, to AI. I think uh, we would be only happy to support with that, and uh, essentially we have a huge variety of, of uh, expertise. I loved how it was uh, done by uh, FOC and the U.S. Uh, chairmanship, uh, and uh, this is something that Lisa was uh, also leading, uh, this consultation with civil society on donor principles uh, for human rights in digital age. It was uh, really nice to have uh, everyone in the same room and everyone having essentially truly having the opportunity to express their opinion. And um, we also have the result of that discussion. So this, I think, something which is very tangible, has practical result. This is something which is missing and we, which we could do more. Thank you, Ali. All right, so in terms of the FOC, uh, but there's also Michael in the room, so I'm also looking at you in terms of the Forum on Information and Democracy. Um, working with member states and the potential that you have to support us in countries where there's no democracy. And since the Netherlands, you will be sharing the FOC next year. I really urge you to help us because our online democracies are under attack and it's not going to change tomorrow. And 2024 is a very important year because there will be a lot of elections throughout the world. So there will be a lot of demand on the FOC. Honestly, the FOC is not accessible and is, is not known for the majority of the people from the global majority. So I think that uh, the, the FOC is accessible for DC groups, right? So online freedom and digital rights groups based in Washington, DC. For us, based in Southeast Asia or in the African continent, we don't know about the FOC and we don't know how you can help us. So I think the best thing that you could do first is to better, better promote your work so we can better understand how the FOC can actually support us and actually support us in demand of true democracy. Uh, we really need uh, statements coming from uh, IFOC members uh, that are targeting our authoritarian governments. Um, we are trying our best, you know, we are a coalition, the ASEAN coalition to stop digital dictatorship, but we are also part of the Southeast Asia CPN targeting tech companies, but we are just a handful of people. So we actually need your support and there's a real need for the IOC to look at the global majority and to engage with us. So when you are doing stakeholders engagement, please don't do them only in DC. There's a need for you to come to us because we need your input, we need your recommendations, and we need your statement to target our governments and also the private sector in our, um, in our countries. So there's a need to you, to you to come to us. Why? Because for most of the people from the global majority, traveling to Europe or to the US is not easy, right? There's visa restrictions. So it's always the same people that you get to meet. 
It's always the people who can travel and the people who have access to you. There's also a need for the IOC to not only talk to the traditional digital rights organization, but the, to, to the broader human rights field. The digital space is becoming more and more important. I mean, we're all moving into the metaverse. What's happening offline is now happening online. So there's a need also for human rights groups to understand and to engage with the F uh, FOC. So really, looking at us, uh, inclusivity is key. Engaging with the global majority and bringing the FOC to the global majority countries is really important because not everybody will be able to travel to you. Invest uh, in civil society, being able to engage with you. Uh, financially supporting groups that are fighting against authoritarian governments online. It's also very important because most of the time, not everybody can engage and not everybody, everybody can do this work. Also, this need to understand that the work that we do is also putting us as at threat. Um, a lot of us sometimes cannot speak publicly or cannot engage. A lot of activists have to speak or have to remain anonymous. I mean, Freedom of the Net Report uh, has a lot of uh, anonymous uh, authors as well. So there, there's a real need for IFC to look at the global majority and to understand us, to come to us and to also financially support us because we need, uh, we need this support to be able to fight against digital dictatorship. Because uh, what Emily was saying, I was uh, also thinking that you have this uh, access to governmental people, essentially, which is uh, usually what uh, what is missing uh, a lot on, uh, let's say, not at the global IGF, probably, but uh, at uh, the regional discussions, uh, because we also have regional national IGFs, and uh, it is always a struggle to get uh, these uh, governmental representatives uh, to be present in the room. So I would say you can also uh, focus on working at least with those uh, countries uh, which are members of uh, FOC so that uh, to somehow encourage and maybe also to build connections between uh, them and these uh, local regional communities because uh, uh, they could be part of these uh, conversations, they could, uh, they could um, get into some specific uh, uh, partnerships and work on some issues uh, together. I think from my region of Southeast uh, Europe it is uh, maybe only Georgia and Moldova who are uh, members of FOC. Uh, but at least at that level, at least those few countries and uh, um, because I know I'm also um, part of uh, um, IGF for Southeastern Europe and uh, well, I know first-hand experience how challenging it is uh, to, to get uh, in touch with governmental people. So that would be also a very practical uh, help from, uh, from your side, just at least to help to get connected with these people and to have them in the room. Is there anything you want to say before we go to Q&A about the FOC? Well, I mean, these are very concrete and, 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 and thoughtful points. We're writing our plan of action as we speak. I mean, we just had it out for, 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 for consultations with the AN network. And I mean, these are great points that we're happy to, 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 uh, to, well, to, to digest and uh, we'll bring them further. I think that it's very interesting to say that, that the Freedom Online Conference is a, is a missed, uh, that, that it's being missed. It's very nice to hear because we did, uh, we st there, there was, a, there was. Well, I think COVID was the first reason not to organize it, but also because there, there, there's a lot, there are already so many conferences. We've got RightsCon, we've got IGF. So I mean, to, it's, it, it would be good to to discuss maybe later to see how these, how we can like be make best use of the space and time and and call footprint that we <laughs> that we have to to make sure that we can uh, can make use of that. Um, and 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 and, and, uh, and in, uh, the other points on on on. I think many of, m at least myself, but also many of our colleagues within the uh, FOC are very open always to, to have discussions with 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 um, with, with human rights defenders and, and digital defenders. So I think it would be great to maybe see if we can promote that strand of work and to have direct contact outside of the AA network. We could also have a long talk about representation in the AA network, and I think we should also have that. But I mean, these are these are very valid points, and we will take the certainly take them forward. One last thing, on the security side, as the FOC, we did uh, uh, create a group called the Digital Defenders Partnership, which is focusing on holistic support for human rights defenders and digital defenders at risk. Um, and that's, that's specifically aimed at, at digital defenders and civil society groups that are facing online threats, but also now physical and well, psychological threats, et cetera, et cetera. And they are, I mean, they, that, that's, that's one of the concrete results that we, are, we continue to support um, as the FOC, so we do try to keep an eye on it, but it's always great to to have uh, to get well to to to, uh, to have have concrete uh, suggestions on how to improve these things. Thank you. 
Uh, I'll just make a pitch. I mean, if RightsCon's not happening until 2025, <laughs> there is a little space in our calendars for an FOC conference. Well, I can see if we can invite everyone to the Netherlands. But I have All to right, everybody, that. we're going to the Netherlands. Uh, you're going to kill me. All right, we've got 15 minutes. I uh, want to open it up to y'all. Who has a question? Anybody? Hi, Lisa. <laughs> oh, yes, Jen. Yeah, thanks everyone for this fabulous discussion. I learned a lot. Um, you know, in thinking about how we can make meaningful impacts since we're at a UN conference, curious to hear what people think about the global digital compact, pros, cons, what we see happening with it. Step right in <laughs> if anybody wants to take that tiny question. Yeah, and we also have questions. We can just get them all maybe and then. <laughs> Oliver? For the gentleman, uh, you mentioned that you can support, provide some type of support for people who are um, under some sort of threat for their online activism. So I was wondering if you could explain what type of mechanisms you have available in terms of what, to send lawyers if they're already in prison or something like that? I'm just curious to know what exactly do you mean by that, bearing in mind the ge geography, bearing in mind different juridical systems, and so on and so on. What is is not crime in given legislation. Thank you. I'm just going to collect them all. We'll do Oliver and then Lisa, then we should answer some, because I'll forget the question. <laughs> Hi, this is uh, Oliver. I won't give my organization name if you don't mind, just because of security reasons. But. Um, I think it's really important for FOC to um, be a bit more clear with the outside world about what they're doing in regards to the UNESCO guidelines, which the global CSOs in the global south are extremely concerned about the direction of the guidelines and how they will encourage authoritarian states to crack down on the digital space. Uh, we haven't seen much from FOC, not that we ever would really see it, but it would be very useful to know that behind the scenes there is actually some pushback on something that looks like it's being driven by authoritarian state members of UNESCO. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa from USAID. Um, so I've been doing a lot of stakeholder consultations this year in different countries where we are doing work or trying to scope out potential for new work. And one of the things that keeps coming up when we talk about international human rights frameworks and the GDPR and the DSA and the DMA and the EU AI Act and all of these, these frameworks is that other countries, particularly in the global majority, see the risk-based um, European model, they see the laissez-faire industry-based American model, they see the Chinese state-based model, and they don't want to have any of those models plopped into their space, right? They're thinking about like, what is this third way? So it's very like Cold War kind of rhetoric of like, we're in the third space and what does that mean and how are we gonna figure out a regional approach perhaps or a national approach? And I think one of the key concerns is that, you know, when you, when you plop the GDPR into Serbia or Indonesia or Kenya or wherever, there are certain aspects of the regulation that are extremely onerous for countries that are at a different income level than um, a lot of European countries and that are very challenging to implement when you don't have the oversight capacity and um, there's perhaps lack of political will and politicization of some of these oversight bodies. And so that's also a concern. And so I, I've sensed that there's a real frustration among a lot of actors in civil society and local tech in, in different countries um, with this sort of very, what people have expressed as like a heavy handed, like the international human rights framework is the thing to implement everywhere. And so what are your thoughts, it can be for anyone on the panel, about how to navigate that so that you still have the overall protections and safeguards that are being transferred 
it, to the extent that they're going to be useful in those contexts for human rights defenders and, and activists and the like, but you're not um, imposing aspects of that regulation or imposing at all, really. You're like, there's a space for a conversation about what the human rights protections and safeguards look like in different contexts. Anything else before we dive on in? Okay, all right. Who uh, wants to start? My esteemed panelists, Olga, I'm look. There you go. And I can also repeat the questions if need be and make sure we answer them all. Um, so on Global Digital Compact, uh, I think this, uh, this is the same uh, theme for me as for Freedom Online Coalition. I would want to see more clarity about what is happening, where it is going, and especially for civil society, how to be part of that, because there is a lot of frustration uh, at the moment uh, as to how they can engage. Uh, and uh, same, we were trying to see how we can support uh, our implementing partners to engage in this process, and we don't really see a clear, a clear way or, or, or a clear venue where this can uh, happen. Um, for the regulations, um, for, the, uh, for Lisa's question, I think, uh, the problem is that we think everything which is coming from the EU is uh, just uh, will solve all our problems. This is uh, ideal and the standard which we all should be using, uh, which is, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, has its own challenges once we start to, to implement and uh, go to enforcement uh, phase. But uh, I think there are there are always uh, the, the there is the framework of principles and standards uh, which, uh, let's say, are basic and uh, which can be replicated in every single country. Uh, but uh, then you also should be aware that if you go into some detailed regulations, uh, then uh, they should be also uh, conscious of, of the context uh, where, the, where they are being uh, um, th thrown to. Uh, so it requires a a dialogue and a conversation uh, b with the national uh, uh, legislators, uh, but also probably uh, some capacity building uh, for them to understand that uh, it's uh, okay, because what countries are doing, they just take the, t the text of GDPR and implement as their national law. And then when it comes to implementation, now uh, we have uh, uh, to face a lot of uh, challenges, but then what you can do, the law is already there. So it's uh, it has to be done at a little bit earlier stage when uh, just uh, the law, uh, some specific legal act is being incorporated into the national legal system. Thank you. So I'm gonna answer the question related to the protection of human rights. Um, as Olga said, there is a need to also understand the local context. And um, most of the legislation, I mean, most of, of the Southeast Asian governments, and I'm gonna talk about Thailand mainly is that we have a Data Protection Act, you know, and wh what the Thai government said is that, oh, we just took the GDPR and we developed the Data Protection Act, so we are, you know, uh, following the, the EU example, uh, but there's no real oversight, there's no independent oversight, it's full, uh, it's totally government-led oversight, and there's no remedy, and there's uh, an exemption into that law that allows the government to violate our data under the consideration of national security. So governments, I would say, are really good, you know, to replicate what the EU is doing, which is a challenge for us, because we want them to engage in a dialogue with parliamentarians, but also with civil society. And what governments are doing is that they're saying, I'm taking the German example, I'm taking the EU example, and I'm developing this law, and it's government-led, it's from the executive, it's, it's not from the legislative, and it's, it allows the government not to engage with civil society. So there's no dialogue. So that's a real frustration for us. And they think that the, then they go into diplomatic discussion with diplomats in the country, but also at the global level at the UN, saying we are following global standards and we are following good standards because we are um, in line with, with, the, with the EU. So it's a real challenge for us because then diplomats believe it. And diplomats are then congratulating Thailand for having a Data Protection Act instead of really looking into the act because the act is, is in Thai unless a civil society translates it for the, for the international community to know. So it's really important for us that I don't think civil society is against international human rights law. Like we are for international human rights law. Actually, we want governments to respect international human rights law. We just want to make sure that when there is uh, exchange between global north countries and global majority countries, 
um, that this exchange take into consideration our context and that governments, like when they are exchanged, the Thai government or the Lao government going to Austria or Australia to look at AI, for example, AI regulation, uh, or when the Thai government is saying we are putting together an AI advisory committee and they are inviting experts from all around the world, is just to appear as a good student or it's just to appear as a good member state at the UN, but in reality, they're just fooling the world. And never ever we have uh, the expert and the other government engaging with the Thai government, helping to develop those laws. Who is asking the Thai government, but where is civil society? Where is the dialogue with civil society? Where is the dialogue with parliamentarians? So this is where the frustration is coming. It's the lack of dialogue and it's the lack of understanding of the context. And it's how easily EU member states and also the US and the international community can be fooled by our governments. Thank you. That was a great point, and I, I, I mean, I think that for us, I mean, I think that 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 although there might be some people that have hoped it, I think that the the univ well the uni the, the the worldwide rollout or effect of GDPR came to everyone as a little bit of a surprise, right? And then we start claiming Brussels effect and stuff like that. But I mean, I think that we didn't really plan on it <laughs> to be well. I mean, it's my pr I was not there in the room. I don't know, but I mean, I think that we were. Uh, it, it's, it's, I, I would expect that that I mean, we're, we're diplomats. We're human beings. We are. Work from nine to five, and I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, th I mean, <laughs> I don't, but, but I mean, th so the point being is, is that I think that that we have to learn by doing on this, and I think that we, I mean, your feedback on this is extremely helpful, and, 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 and each time, we'll get better at it, and and and, uh, but we need your your honest and and open criticism on these things in order to 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 do learn from it and to do implement it. Uh, the next time we'll have these discussions on how are we going to 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 have shared a uh, shared approach on the AI, or how are we going to have a shared approach uh, on, on the DSA or the DMA? So that, that's something that I would just urge everyone to, to keep doing, and then also reach out to not only the embassy, but also try to, well, I mean, uh, try to find the, the FOC focal points, to, to, to because these are the ones that are probably more resonating to these arguments than, 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 than someone who's covering 27 issues because we're two people in the embassy uh, so that's that I mean that's that's just very challenging and so I w yeah I, w I would I would try to 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 well to, to do that um, as as on on the UNESCO guidelines I think that that is indeed a, a, a an, an, an we've been following that progress with great interest we have as as the FOC we did we did try to we, we, we did approach it. We, we have uh, the, the advisory network wrote a terrific uh, comments on it, and we took that all at heart when um, talking to UNESCO and then participating in the Internet for Trust um, conference. Um, I mean, this is not completely FOC, but I do want to mention our recently launched global declaration on information integrity that, 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 that was signed by uh, 30 countries, and more countries are signing on to it. Which do try to 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 say well, these these imp th it's very important that we are going to fight disinformation and make sure that we are promoting information integrity. But at the same time, we do need these these human rights guide rails, so to speak, in these international processes like the UNESCO process, but also the code of conduct that's being that's being run by 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 Under Secretary General Fleming to make sure that, that the human rights language is there in those processes. Th so that's something that we are really pushing for as the, as the Netherlands and, and, and with 30 other countries, including the US, the UK, but also countries like Brazil and Argentina and Chile have signed up to those principles. We do try to, to promote that in, in, in that way. Um, about the GDC, um, that's that's just. Uh, all, I mean, I think that we. Uh, it's also very difficult for for us, at least as as diplomats, to to uh, for me to to follow it. I mean, the 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 the, the process. I mean, there've been there've been some stakeholder rounds. We we attended those. I mean, they were open to wa to watch online. I mean, w you mo know as much as I do. I mean, <laughs> that's that's. It's just, yeah, we we are following it, and we try to make the best of it. And uh, we do think that it's great that at least in the in the in the chapters or in the. In the, in the the sections that are there, human rights online is is, is really there. So we do have a, have good hope for it, but we have to see how it, how it will develop. And for us, it's a really a question on how this is something that we also set out in uh, pretty publicly. I would say in, in, it's even in the strategy that we say, well, I mean, that there's th 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 we have to strike a good balance between the GDC and the WISIS, and they are both very important. And we have to find a good way in 
in, in protecting human rights online. We have to find a way to, 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 to encapsulate multi-stakeholderism in these governing pro processes. But at the same time, you, uh, we have to make also sure that these processes are really transparent, that everyone can engage, that, that the global majority countries have a seat at the table, that we include them into the process. And that's something that we, that, 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 that remains, that, that remains a constant challenge. I mean, that, but that's always, of course, a challenge in these issues. Um, yeah. And then on supporters, support for human rights defense at risk. And the Netherlands funds tons of NGOs and, and initiatives to protect human rights defenders who are at risk locally. So we, for example, fund Frontline Defenders that has, I think, 12 regional coordinators all over the world speaking. Well, I mean, Southeast Asia, of course, difficult with tons of languages. But uh, for example, in Latin America, we have, we, they, they speak local languages. They, they, they are there. I mean, there's someone for Southeast Asia. But, I mean, but they're really trying to provide practical, holistic support for at-risk human rights defenders, both in a legal way, but also pr pr courses in physical protection, digital security, psychological well-being, et cetera, et cetera. We don't, uh, we, uh, I mean, we fund that uh, with Frontline. We have uh, Reporters on Frontier, who we fund through the EU. We support uh, Protect Defenders that has a conglomerate of, of, of uh, which is a consortium of 13 organizations that are doing this worldwide. Um, I mean, I think that there are tons, uh, there are tons of organizations that are doing try that do try to provide these kinds of direct, practical support for at-risk human rights defenders, and um, some of them are even here. I mean, Access Now has a booth; they have a helpline. They're connected with defend defenders. They work together with Frontline. And if you want to know more about that, I'm happy to to speak for hours about this topic because I'm really uh, passionate about it. These microphones, tricky. Well, thank you all. We're we're at time. I think that we could go on for a really long time. All these, uh, there's just so many initiatives. I'm so tired. I'm sure everybody else is. I'm like, we've got a seven person team and we have to make tough decisions about how to engage and when not to. Uh, and I'm grateful that we're in partnership with all the fantastic panelists for people in this room um, that we're doing this work together. Um, and I won't hold you back from dinner anymore. I know we're all, we're all hungry as well. So thank you for joining us. Uh, a pitch again. You can read the latest Freedom on the Net report, freedomhouse.org. Let us know what you think. Uh, and looking forward to a great week. Thanks, all.